Um, so this is First Samuel chapter 6 from verse 1. Now, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. So that means the ark of God stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven months. Imagine the, the number of calamity that will have, you know, that will have been recorded. And uh, the Philistines called the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. Verse 3. And they said, If ye send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. When ye shall be then, Sorry, then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Can you see that? So when they called their diviners and their priests, meanwhile, these priests they called were evil priests. Too. So the same way we have priests in the kingdom of light, we also have priests in darkness. So because these people were, were dark people, so they called their dark priests, they called their designer, you know, the diviners, so they did some incantations. And then from the incantations, they now discovered, okay, this thing you have done now is called trespass. You know what trespass means? Trespassing means when, you know, when you cross your boundary. So that means taking the ark of God from the people of God is a trespass. So that's why the people will not return the ark with an empty hand. They will have to attach a trespass offering. For instance, an example of trespass is if a man decides to sleep with... Now, for instance, if a married man decides to sleep with the wife of his friend, that's trespass because he has his own wife. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, the priest now told them that. Now, in this case, so you will not return the ark empty-handed. You have to hide some offerings so that God can forgive your sins. Verse 4. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we wish we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the laws of Philistines. For one plague was on you all <clears throat> and on, on your lots. Can you see that? They were to give five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the, of, the, of the lots of the Philistines. Verse 5. Wherefore, you shall make images of your emeralds and images of of your mice that mar the land. Can you see that? And you shall give glory unto the God of Israel. For adventure, he will lighten his hand off from you and off your goods and off your gods and from your land. Can you see that? So this was what they were asked to do. Now, they were to make images of their problems. For instance, there were certain mice that came to you know, to destroy their things. So they are going to make golden images of that mice, then golden images of that emerald that grew on their body. Can you see that? Therefore, do ye, therefore do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When, okay, let me read that again. We are for then do ye harden your heart, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. When he had wrought wonderfully among them, among them, did they not let the people go as they departed? Now therefore, make a new cart, can you see that? And take two milch cane, for which there had come no yoke. And tie the king to the cart and bring their calves home from them. 
and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put jewels of gold, which you which you return him, which you return him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it that it may go. Can you see that? Now, in all, you won't believe that the Philistines they were not even willing to let go of the ark. They were so arrogant. They were like, ah, no, no, ah, we have taken this thing. How, how are we going to return it? That was why, you know, that question was asked in, in verse 6. Wherefore then do ye harden your heart? Even when they now know the solution, they were still reluctant in doing it. Can you see that? So, the people now give them the instruction. Get a new cart. Look at that. They were spending a lot just to pay for their trespass. They have to get a new cart. They have to get new oxen that's going to, you know, that they are going to tie to the cart and many other things. They lost their people and now they have to lose their resources. Why? Because they have to pay for their trespass. Verse, verse 10. Verse 10 now. And the men did so. Thank God. Finally, they obeyed. And the men did so and took two milch, milch king, and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart. And the coffer with the means of gold and the images of their emeralds. Can you see that? And the king took the straight way to the way of Beshemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right and or to the left, and to the Lord's. Okay, and the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, and they rejoiced to see it. Can you see that? So when they set this thing on the ark, on the on the cart, they they, they, you know, they left it. So it was that animal that was moving the cart. So what, all they did was to follow it, just to supervise. And, you know, to see that the cart is actually moving in the right direction. And God so good, the cart did not turn right, did not turn left. It was going straight to the right place. Now the question is, if the cart was empty, then who drove the cart? How was the you know the cat able to move to the right direction? The, the the answer is simple. It was God Himself that sat on the cat and drove it. God led the animals to His people. He led the cat to the right place. So all the Philistines did was to supervise, and they they went back at the borders of um, Beth Shemesh. All right, when the people of that land saw the ark, they were so happy to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a, a Beth Shemite, and stood there, and, uh, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they cleaved the wood of the cart, and they, yes, and they clave the wood of the cart and offered the king a what a burnt offering unto the Lord. Can you see that? This was what God wanted. But the people they only captured the ark, but they don't know how to maintain it. Can you see that immediately the ark landed, the people, because they were Israelites, they understand the language of the ark. Immediately they offered the burnt offering. Those were the things God was expecting in the land of the Philistines, but he did not get it, so he had to fight them. When God expects something from your life and your life is not giving it, <laughs> he may fight you. That's the truth. 
when your life is not meeting up with God's expectation, then expect, <laughs> expect is, is rebook. Verse 15. And the Levite took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Bat Shemesh offered both offering and sacrificed, you know, and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. Can you see that? They offered burnt offerings and also made other sacrifices. To what? To who? To the ark. Can you see that? Now, when the ark came, you see, don't try to house what you cannot manage. Don't try to house what you don't, what you are not built to, to keep. Now, when the ark of God came to Beth Shemesh, now, it was not just anybody that brought it down from the cart. The Bible says it was the it was the Levite. Who are the Levites? Those were the people consecrated for the work of the altar. Can you see that? That shows that now the ark is in the right place. That was why you know the the right the right activities were being made, done to it. Right people carried it. Right sacrifices was now done to it. Verse sixteen. When the, when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. Verse 17. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Hashdod, one. For Gaza, one. For Ashkelon, one. For Gath, one for Akron, one. Are you there? So that means they, they, they returned, um, you know, Ashdod one, Gaza two, Ashkelon three, Gat four, Akron five. So that means they, 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 they returned five golden emeralds to the Israelite. Can you see that? Now these things were expensive. It cost them a lot, but they have to just do it as a way of paying for their trespass. Verse 18. And the golden mace, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lots, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto great stones of Abel, whereon they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remained unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beshemite. Now, be, in, through this um, trespass offering that was paid by the Philistines, I can tell you something happened to their economy. Because if you calculate the value of what they sent with that cat as a trespass offering, in our time, it is billions of naira. I tell you the truth, billions of naira. So that means, you know, it is easy to sin, but the, 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 the consequence of that thing you are doing can be more heavy than you ever imagine. So it's better not to even trespass. Are you getting what I'm saying? Verse 19. And he smote the men, and he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote, he smote the people. He smote of the people 50,000 50, and three scores. That is 50,000. Okay, 50,000 three score and 10 men. That is 50,000 and 70 men were killed because they looked into the ark. And the people lamented because the Lord has smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Can you see that? Now, God was so strict with his rules. You don't look into the ark. Are you there? The Levites that carried the ark, they were not looking into the ark. They understand the principles guarding the ark of God. So these people, they felt, oh, the ark of God. You know, the ark of God usually, you know, it was situated as at Shiloh. But, you know, due to this kidnapping thing, finally the ark is now in Beth Shemash. So the people now thought they can just deal with the ark anyhow. 
God killed 50,070 people. This was this was in the midst of his people. Can you see that? So God is, that's why the Bible says, the standard of the law stands short. So God will not bend the standard because he wants you to, he wants it to be comfortable to you. No, you are the one to flow with his standards. Are you getting what I'm saying? And the men of Beth Shemash said, Who is able to stand before the only Lord God? And to whom shall we go up? And to whom shall he go up from us? Verse 21, which is the last verse. And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kajet Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down. And fetch it up to you. Can you see that? Because of the great numbers of people that died in their land, they are, they are now calling on another nation. Please, we beg you in the name of Jesus, you come and take this ark. Can you see that? Now, the ark of God represents the presence of God. But there are rules guiding it. And if you break any of these rules, you will face the consequence. That's it. The Bible says, whosoever breaks the edge, a serpent will bite. Many of us pray for the presence of God, but we must understand that that presence has a rule. If you break it, there is a consequence. It's just like you carry the ark of God and you don't understand how to keep it. One way or the other, you may end up breaking the rules and you will face the consequences. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. This is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it. Um, we'll be looking at um, First Samuel chapter 7 from verse 1. <clears throat> and the men of Kijat Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Habinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar the son to keep the ark of the Lord. Now, Eliezer was sanctified to keep the ark of the Lord. He, he was sanctified to, to service the ark of the Lord. What does that mean? That means for you to function with the ark of the Lord, you need sanctification. Remember that um, the ark of the Lord symbolizes the presence of God. So that means you cannot uh, interact with the presence of God without sanctification. Verse 2, And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kijet Jerim, that the time was long, for it, for it was twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Can you see? The, 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 the ark, you know, spent a lot of time in Kijet Jerim. That was 20 years. So it got to a point the, the Israelites began to lament that this the ark is staying too long in this place. Verse 3 And Samuel spoke to unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and hash terror from among you, and prepare your heart unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of of the Philistines. Can you see that? So the moment the ark was stolen from Shiloh, something happened to the Israelites. Idol, you know, idolatry, you know, entered into their system. So because there was no ark to sacrifice to, some of the Israelites began to raise gods for themselves. And some of these gods, you know, were, you know, was um, Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was part of the God that the people now begin to worship because they no longer have the ark in their midst. So that ark that was stolen from Shiloh opened the door for idolatry. Now let's go to verse 4. And the children of Israel did put away Balim. Can you see not only Ashtaroth now, they also worship Balim. Balim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Can you see that? So who made that decree? It was Samuel. Samuel told them to put away the string gods in their midst, and they did. Can you see that? Now, in verse in, in chapter in chapter seven here, we can see that Samuel has fully taken the place of a piece 
of a priest. He has fully taken the, the role of a judge over Israel. Automatically, he became a judge because uh, the two sons of Haley, they are dead. Haley is also dead. So, as I mean, the two sons of Haley, you know, are alive. There will have been a kind of contention as to who will succeed Haley. But God did it in such a way that Samuel was unopposed. So it was just clear that, okay, the next one is Samuel. Because there was nobody to oppose him. Those that would have opposed Samuel from being, you know, from being the judge over Israel had already died. All right, let's check the next verse. Verse 5, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mispe, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. Can you see that? One of the functions of a priest is to pray for the people. If you have been assigned as a leader by the Lord to lead the people of God, you must learn to pray for them. You cannot, pr you cannot lead the people well if you are not praying for them. Praying for the people is what empower you to lead the people. One of the signs to show that you are truly leading the people is that you can pray for them. Please take note of that. Verse 6. And they gathered together to Mispe and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said, There, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the, is the children of Israel in, Mashpe, in Mispe. Can you see that? Now when they got to Mispe, everybody began to repent. They saw their nakedness. They saw, you know, they saw their weakness and they began to cry to the Lord for the forgiveness of their sins. Who brought them into this state? That was Samuel. A good leader must be able to bring his, you know, his followers into repentance. It's not every time that when you talk, they just laugh and just laugh. No. There are times that when you talk also, your statement must be able to you know, break them down, to bring them to that point where they can repent of their sins verse 7 and the philistines heard that the children of israel were gathered together to mispe the laws of the philistine went up against israel and when the children of israel heard it they were afraid of the philistines can you see that you no know, the table has now turned originally it was the philistines that used to be afraid of the israelites but now the israelites were now afraid of the philistines why? Because they choose to worship idols. Now, the idols they began to worship was what made them a slave to their enemies. They so much became a slave that once they hear the name Philistine, now they get scared. Are you there? When we choose to walk in disobedience, we are empowering our enemies against us. We are making ourselves slaves to them. That's what happens. Verse 8, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. Can you see that? Verse 9, And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. Can you see that? Now, leadership is so powerful that even when God chooses not to hear the followers, he can hear for the sake of the leader. Now, everybody in Israel were praying here. Everybody were repenting, crying to the Lord. But the Lord said, when Samuel cried unto the Lord on behalf of the Israelites, the Lord heard him. So a nation cried. God did not hear that nation. But their leader cried. God heard their leader. So it will now mean that the voice of one man was more stronger than the voice of a whole nation. That's the power of, of, of leadership. Are you there? So that's why we need to ensure that we, we, we work with the right leaders. If you are not working with the right leaders, you may be setting yourself up for destruction. Because if God will not hear your voice as a follower, at least it will hear the voice of your leader. So your leader should be such a person that can bring you into brokenness, that can bring you into simplicity, that can bring you into repentance. 
verse 10 and Samuel okay verse 10 and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them and they were smitten before Israel can you see that now because the Lord heard the voice of their leader now their enemies were defeated even the Israelites did not need to really fight or stress themselves God himself attacked the Philistines and they were defeated so that means God fought the battle for the Israelites without the Israelites having to struggle to fight May the Lord fight your battles in the name of Jesus. The Bible says, when the ways of a man pleases God. Can you see that? Now, because God heard the voice of their leader, God fought for them. They did not even need to struggle. God fought. So they, they, they got a cheap victory. All they did was just to, to look at their enemy. They were just there watching. And yet, God was doing, the, 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 you know, God was doing everything for them. Verse 11. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Betka. Can you see that? It was after God had already dealt with the Philistines. That was when the Israelites now pursued them. So that thing the Lord did to the Philistines had already, you know, uh, weakened their strength. The Lord sucked the strength of, of their enemies. So it was easy for the Israelites to fight them and conquer them. May the Lord suck the strength of your enemy so that you will be empowered to defeat them in the name of Jesus. Verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mishpeh and Shen and, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Either to at the Lord helped us. Now this is the origin of the word Ebenezer. This is where the, 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 the word Ebenezer, you know, was originated from. My stone of help. He that so as the Lord helped us. Ebenezer. Alright, verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more unto the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Can you see that? Now, when the moment Samuel resumed leadership, it became hard for the enemies of the people of God to have access to them. And the Bible says, all through the days of Samuel, the hand of the Lord was strong upon the Philistines. Meaning, there was no time in the leadership of Samuel when the Philistines came and defeated the Israelites. No. The only time the Philistines came and defeated the Israelites was in the time of Eli. But the moment Samuel resumed into leadership, everything changed. The Philistines no longer have that strength to attack or defeat the people of God. Can you see that? So the kind of leader you have can also determine the kind of victory you, you record. Many of us experience constant defeat in the battles of life because of the kind of leader that we have. May you be led aright in the name of Jesus. May God choose the right leaders for you. May you be a right leader. In the name of Jesus. Uh, verse 14. And the cities and the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even to Gath. And the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Can you see that? So that, that was not only what God did. God also brought restoration. So the, the land of God, you know, Akron that has been taken by the Philistines was restored. The Israelites took their possession. Why? Because of right leadership. And the Bible says there was peace between Israel and the Hamorite. Verse 15, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. The word judge here can also mean Samuel led the Israelites. In those days, there was no, you know, there was no king. So, all they had were judges. Are you there? And the judges were, were the prophets. The, the priests were the leaders. The priests, 
you know the priests were like the the presidents of the nation as at that time the reason is because god wanted to lead the people and for god to lead his people he has to lead them by his priest so in in those days if god is not leading you by his priest then you are you are on your own so because god wanted to lead his people he has to lead them by his priest and these priests are also the prophets you can call them a priest and you can call them the prophet of god so samuel is a priest and samuel is also a prophet of god and the function of the priest then is to judge the people now the word judge there is not to condemn them no the word judge there means to rule the people to determine the the, the 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 movement of things in the land. That's what it means to judge, to give direction to the people, to counsel the people, to bring the word of the Lord to the people. That's the meaning of the word judge. 16. And he went from year to year in Sakut to Bethel and Gilga and Mispe and judged Israel in all those places. Can you see? So Samuel judged the Israelites in Bethel, in Gilgah, in Maspe. And, you know, he was moving around to ensure that the counsel of God is brought to the people. Verse 17. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house. And there he judged Israel. And there he built an altar unto the Lord. Can you see that? So Samuel has his house in Ramah. So even while he traveled from one place to another, judging the nation of Israel, when he's done, he will have to return to Ramah because that is where he stays. That's where his house is. May the Lord help us to be a good leader, one that will lead our people, you know, one that will lead his people into victory and not to defeat in the name of Jesus. One of the signs to show that you are a good leader is that you can lead your people into victory it should not be in your own time that the enemy will prevail over the people of god no no if truly you are a good leader then you should be able to bring victory to the people by the wisdom of god this is the wisdom of god don't sell it um we'll be looking at first samuel chapter 8 and it came to pass when samuel was old that he made his sons judges over israel can you see that when samuel became old you know there, there was a need for them to you know there was a need for him to uh to retire so that another set of leader can continue so he made his sons judges over israel now the name of his firstborn was joel and the name of his second was abia they were judges in Bathsheba. and the sons of samuel walked not in his ways but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment can you see that samuel was a very good man but his children his two sons joel and them um, abia were not walking in the in you know in the direction of his father samuel was a good man but his two sons were corrupt just like ophni and phineas now the question is why is it that the same thing that happened in the family of eli seems to be playing out in the family of samuel Eli also had two sons who were sons of Belial. And the same thing happened to Samuel too. Samuel had two sons, Joel and Abia. And both of them were sons of Belial because they, they were also uh, defiling the temple of God. They took bribe. Their eyes was you know, so much focused on things that they collect different kind of money from the people, you know, extorting the people. They, they, they were not feeding the sheep. They were feeding on the sheep. All right. Verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. Can you see that? So when the elders of Israel saw that, ah, 
the children of Samuel, this man is a good man, but his children are not, uh, they are not good. So they gathered together to speak to Samuel. Verse 5, And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk, walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Can you see? Meanwhile, the intention of God was not to raise a king for the people. God's intention was to continue to lead the people by his priest. So the decision to be ruled by a king from the Israelites was not really their fault. It was because the, 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 the children of Samuel were not capable. They were not just men. Somehow, Samuel the righteous was not able to raise righteous sons. Are you there? Samuel the good was not able to raise good sons. Samuel the God-fearing man was not able to raise sons that are God-fearing. We have to be very careful. Parenting is a serious work. That you are following God does not mean your children will follow God. You have to be deliberate about it. So, the Israelites requested for a king because the children of Samuel were not worthy. Assuming the children of Samuel were worthy, they wouldn't have requested for a king. So it was the misbehaviors of the children of Samuel that led to their demand for a king. Meanwhile, it was only Israel that did not have king. They were the only ones that God ch chose to, to rule by, by his priests and his prophets. Other nations had kings. But, you know, the Israelites were not even complaining. But it got to a time they have to complain because <laughs> with the look of things, they knew that if Samuel died without doing anything, <laughs> there's going to be an issue in the land of Israel. Basically, the, the 12 tribes may have to split and all of them will stand on their own. So in order for this not to happen, they told him that they will need a king. Verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. So when they made that request, Samuel was not happy about it because Samuel knew that that is definitely not the will of God. So he prayed unto the Lord to hear from God. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people. In all, in all that they say unto you, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Can you see what the Lord said? The Lord said, well, since they have requested for a king, eh, give them a king. It's not you that they have rejected. They have actually rejected me. They don't want me to reign over them. Can you see this? See, when it comes to leadership, we have to be very careful. Don't be that follower that that talks to the leaders anyhow. Can you see God is not even talking about uh, the misbehaviors of the children of Samuel? God did not say, well, uh, well it's not your fault. Uh, it's because the children of Samuel are misbehaving. No. Even while those two children are, you know, those two children are misbehaving, God still expects them not to desire for it. You know, not to desire a king. God was not even saying, well, okay, 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 yes, you deserve a king, since even the two sons of Sam, Samuel are, are, are sons of Belial. God knew the two sons of, uh, of Samuel are not working in his will. He knew they are not working in his will, yet he still want them to be there. So sometimes when you see a leader doing certain things and um, you are complaining, you may be working you know, you may be walking in iniquity. You may be trespassing from what you are saying. Because you are the one seeing the mistakes, God may still want to bring out something. So that means if the people had waited, it is possible that God does something to the children of Samuel. He said that he kills them, just like he did with the family of Eli, and raise another priest, or he changed them and make them fit for the work. But the children of Israel, they were not patient enough, so they came up with their own idea. Verse 8, according to, the, according to all the works 
which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. So the Lord was speaking to someone and said, I don't mind them. The same thing they did to me is what they are doing to you. Of course, they, 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 they are forsaking me to, to serve idols. So they are also leaving you too. It's a normal thing. This was what God was telling someone concerning the Israelites. Verse 9. Now therefore, hearken unto their voice, albeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of a king. Now, you know, then the Lord, you know, Samuel now spoke to the people that came to him to demand for a king. Now, please listen. It was not all the Israelites that came to Samuel. It was just, you know, selected, selected people. They were the leaders of, you know, certain regions in Israel. So they came together to present the the desire of the people. So what those men came to tell Samuel was the desire of all the you know all the people in the nation of Israel. Verse 11. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint them, and he will appoint him captains over thousand, over thousands, and captains over fifty, and will set them to hear the to hear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instrument of war, an instrument of his chariots, and he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And they will take your field, your vineyards, your holy vineyards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And they will make the tent of your seed, and of your vineyard, and give to his officers, and to his servants. And they will make your, your men servants, and your maid servants, and your goodliest young men, and your horses, and put them into you know and put them to his work and he will take the tent of your sheep and ye shall be his servant and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen you and the lord will not hear you in that day nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of samuel and they said no but we will have a king over us now samuel had already told them that when this man come is going to make you a slave. It will be ruling you, but the relationship between the two of you is going to be a, a slave to master relationship. He told them what the king is going to do to them, how he's going to enslave them, take what they have, rob them of some things, make them slaves, make them servants, make them serve. And the people were they were you know they were willing to accept it. Are you there? Now, this, this is now telling us that a, a good leadership system should not be in form of servant-to-master relationship. It should not have, you know, this servant-to-master relationship. No. A good leadership system should have, you know, you know, it can even be a, 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 a disciple disciple relationship. Yes, the leader must be able to teach those people who is following. Are you there? He must be able to give them instructions that can lead them to God. Instructions that can bring them into repentance. Just like, you know, we have seen in the leadership of Samuel. Verse 20. So they told, you know, in verse 19, they told Samuel, No, we need a king over us that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us to fight our battles can you see that so they wanted to be like other nations 
the, 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 the eyes of the Israelites was on other nations. They were no longer looking at God, they were looking at people. Now when you start looking at people, the problem is that you begin to pattern your life according to the people. But when you start looking at God, you begin to pattern your life according to God. So one of the problems the Israelites had here was that they were looking at people. They were focusing on people. So, and because of that, they begin to build their life according to the people. You hear them say things like, we need a king, just like other nations. Can you see comparison? And also, you know, other nations, when they want to fight war, their king will lead them. Are you there? But for the Israelites, the, the, their priests will not lead them in battle. Their priests will be, will be in the city praying for them while, you know, their captains will lead them. So they also desire that other pattern. They wanted their king to be the one leading them, you know, to fight. So all these things was part of the reason they requested for a king. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and they rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. The word rehearse means, and he, 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 you know, he presented it before the Lord. He told the Lord all that they have, you know, all that they have said to him. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man into his city. Can you see that? At this point, God has agreed to do for them what they desire. You see, when you make a decision, even when the decision is not the right one, if you don't allow God's word to affect you to change it god will leave you god will not force you to bend to his will he can show you this is my will but he cannot force you into it so when you make a decision and you are not patient enough to wait for god to help you you may be left to your decision this was the same thing that was happening to the israelite here the israelite made a decision and yet they were not willing to allow the will of God. So the Lord left them to their, to their desire. May God not leave you to your own ways in the name of Jesus. So we must understand that when we are ready to allow God, God is ready to instruct us. But when we harden our heart and we are saying, this is what I want to do, <laughs> we may be closing the door against God's instruction. God will not instruct you when he knows you will not obey. The moment your heart is hardened, you are likely to lose the instructions of God. Um, we'll be looking at First Samuel chapter nine. First Samuel chapter nine. Now there was a man in Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror the son of Bekorat, the son of Hafia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Can you see that? This was the introduction of a man. The Bible called him a mighty man of power. Ka. That's, that's, you know, that's a big, you know, it's a big um, kind of uh, description. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man. Can you see? Now, the father of Saul was a mighty man. Now, let's look at his, his introduction again. Now, this, this introduction was for the father of Saul. For the father of Saul. Now, there was a man of Benjamin. That means the father of Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. That means automatically Saul himself is from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, number one, the first thing revealed about the father of Saul is he was from the tribe of Benjamin. One, you know, his name is Kish. So Saul's father, the name of Saul's father is Kish. Now, that's number two. Number three, he is the son of Abiel. Number four, is also this, you know, the son of Habiel. That Habiel was the son of Zero. 
That Zerah was the son of Bekorat. That Bekorat was the son of Hafia, who was also a Benjamite. Can you see? You know, uh, four generations were revealed. Four generations. So that means Saul was the fifth generation. Can you see that? Now, not only that, the Bible called the father of Saul a mighty man of power. What does it mean for a man to be a mighty man of power? <laughs> it means that, number one, the first thing to note about such a person is that he's a warrior. He's a warrior. Number two, he is a, he is a, he is a man that cannot be easily defeated. Number three, is a man that understands the language of war. A man who is trained for war. Who knows how to fight battles. Are you there? Number four, is a leader. Number five, is a man that is mighty in strength. Are you there? Such a man that can be compared to Samson. So before the Bible can call a person a mighty man of power, it means the man has power. Another thing to note about him is, you know, from that name, from that title, a mighty man of power, it means he's also wealthy because wealth itself is power. Now, another thing to note about that title is that he has wisdom because wisdom is power. Are you getting what I'm saying? So let's move to verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man. And a a goodly, you know, you know, a choice young man, and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulder and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So that means, as at that time, the the tallest person in the entire land of Israel was Saul. If you see Saul, you just know that <laughs> this one is different. The most handsome, the most, you know, is, is the most handsome and is the tallest. So when you see Saul, you will just know he's just so different. Verse 3. And the houses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise. Go seek the asses. Can you see? So, the father of Saul then gave Saul an instruction. He said, Ah, our house is missing. So please, take one of our servants, go after it, and look for it. Verse 4. So, and he passed through the month of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and there they were not. And they passed through the land of and they passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not can you see that so this was Saul's attempt to look for the sheep but unfortunately as he's passing from one land to the other he could not find he could he could not find them and when they came to the land of Zuf Saul said to his servant that was with him come let us return lest my father leave caring for the horses and take thought of us. Now, he spoke to the servant that went with him, said, hello, let's go back, because uh, if we continue to look for this house, uh, we ourselves may go missing. So, it, it will not just be that our father is now looking for an house, he may end up looking for us. So, let's go back, so that we will not become a concern for our father. Verse 6, and he said to him, Behold, there is in this city a man of God 
and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Let us go either. Paraventure he can show us our way that we should go. So why Saul was planning to go back because <laughs> he has done all his best. There was no way he could, you know, find the ass. So the servant now encouraged him. He said, now, sir, before we go back, uh -huh, I, I heard that there's a man of God in this place. All that he says come to pass. Can you see the testimony of Saul? Can you see the testimony of Samuel? I mean, Samuel had a testimony that everything he says happens. So someone is that kind of person that if he says a thing, just prepare yourself for it. It must surely happen. So the servant of Saul gives Saul an advice and says, let us check. Let's go and meet this man of God. And then let's inquire of him. Maybe he can lead us to where the ass is. Then Saul then said Saul to his servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? Can you see that? You know, Saul was not, uh, was not a bad person. There's a, there's a kind of wisdom that Saul had. Look at the first thing was he was obedient to his father. The father told him to go out and look for the house, and he did not doubt he did not argue. He left. At a point, he decided to go back home because he was concerned about his father. He did not want his father to start looking for them. That's, that, that's, that's a good behavior. And now, they wanted to go and meet a man of God. He's also asking, what do we have that we can give to him? He understands that it is wrong to go and see a man of God empty-handed. That's what many people do today, especially when they are close to the back. They just take advantage of the grace, do what they want to do. They don't sow seed. They don't bless the man. They are always at the receiving end. Daddy, I had a dream. Uh, Mommy, I saw this. What can I do? What can I wear? Always ask him. Yet they are not willing to give. That's not a, that's not a good culture. I think we need to learn from, from Saul. Anytime you are going to meet, whether your father and the Lord or a man of God, you must go with something. Somebody is saying, what if I don't have money? He's, he, you don't have to go and buy a car and take it to him. That little, from the little you have, that little you have is enough. No matter how small it is, gift is gift. God knows that is all you can afford for the moment. Let us learn this culture. It's very important. Don't go to a man of God empty and No matter how, how small it is, go with something. So let's continue. Verse 8. And the servant answered Saul again. And said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. But I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Can you see that? Now, <clears throat> what this man had here was the fourth part of a shekel of silver. What does it mean? That means what the servant had was not even up to a shekel is one shekel you know divided by four that's just one over four of a shekel it's just like when you divide a shekel into four parts and you take one part of it that's to show you how small it is it's just like somebody say somebody say and what i have here uh, is one over four or one quarter of forty thousand that's ten thousand when you divide forty thousand into four and you take a part of it that's 10,000 you are taking. Yet, that was enough to meet the man of God. What does it mean? You don't need to have big things. No. Even from that little you have, you can still give. Are you there? Many people are not getting direction, directions that is needed because they don't know how to give. All they know is to receive, to receive. That is not a good habit. The man of God may not ask you, but wisdom is profitable for direction so they needed a direction from the man of god so they went with an offering you see an offering is an offering 
provided it is coming from a heart of reference. You can give 1,000 Naira and that will be an offering if it is coming from a heart of reference. Meanwhile, you can give 1 million and that will be referred to as a waste if it is not coming from a heart of reference. So whatever you give to God that is coming from a heart that reference him, that is coming from a heart that honors him, is called an offering. I hope you understand that. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, does he speak? Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So that means the prophets in those days were formerly called seers. So you can call them seers. You can call them prophets because in those days, every prophet has the ability to operate in the office of a seer. A seer is that person that can see into the spirit, not in the dream, I mean physically. So if you go to a seer, you, both of you can be seated like this and he will be telling you everything you came for, even without you talking. That's a seer. Now, verse 10. Then said Saul to his servant, well said, come. Let us go. <clears throat> so they went unto the city where the man of God was. Another good quality about Saul here was his reference for God. Saul had honor for, the, for, for God. How do I know? That was why he honored the man of God. If you don't honor God, you cannot honor his ministers. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't even fake it. The reason you will honor God is because you honor, you know, the, the, the reason you will honor is the, the ministers of God is because you, you honor God. Whatever you are doing to the ministers of God, you are doing it to God. That's the truth. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, if you are obedient to the ministers of God, it's a sign that you are obedient to God. If you hate God, you will hate his ministers. The reason some people hate you as a man of God is because they don't like God. It is their anger towards God that they are vesting on you. So you must understand that. Whatever is your disposition to God will be your dis disposition to the ministers of God. That will be your disposition to the sons of God. You must never forget this. All right. So, another lesson to learn about Saul was his reference for God. Just like I said, it was because he honored God. That was why he had honor for the minister of God. Otherwise, he would have said, which minister? Let's go, Jerry. All these fake ministers of God. No. Samuel was, you know, Saul was willing to, to hear from the man of God. All right. Verse 11, <clears throat> and as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the seer here? That was the prophet now. They are referring to Samuel as the seer. And they answered them and said, He is, behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place can you see that so when when they ask for someone they say ah someone is around though you are very you know you are very favored to even meet him so he came for a sacrifice so you can quickly go and see him before before he gets busy can you see that verse 13 As soon as ye be come into the city, ye shall straight away find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes. Because he doeth bless the sacrifice, and afterwards the heat, the heat that be bidding. Now therefore get you up. For about this time ye shall find him. 
Another thing to see is that they, they came in the right time. May the Lord order your steps in the name of Jesus. May you enjoy divine timing in the name of Jesus. They came at the right time. Because if they had come any, any time later than now, they may not even meet him. And they may meet him and yet he will not be able to attend to them because by that time he might have been busy. But because God was the one leading them, they came at the right time. May God lead you in the name of Jesus. May you arrive at the right time in the name of Jesus. So the high place here is the place of sacrifice. So the high place here is used to refer to the place of sacrifice. And um, in, the, in the high place, what they do is not only sacrifice. They can sacrifice to God and also they also eat. They celebrate. Two things happen in high places. One, they sacrifice things to God. Two, the people of God also gathers to eat, to celebrate. Are you there? The, 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 a high place is a place of sacrifice and is also a place of celebration. So, after Samuel have you know, done the offering, he will eat. And people will have to wait for him because if he doesn't come, they will not eat. Can you see the power of leadership? There are many things that if you don't do, your followers will not do as a leader. So as a leader, when you see strange things happening among the people you are leading, don't judge them. Before you begin to shout at them, check yourself. Because they may be doing what they see you do. Are you there? So that's it. That's one thing to note. Okay, verse 14. And they went up into the city. And when they came into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Can you see that? Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come to me. Are you there? So even before Saul met Samuel, God had already spoken to Samuel about Saul. Can you see what God is saying now? Now, in verse 16, you will notice that God was speaking to Samuel concerning the Israelites. And God was not mentioning the fact that, well, he did not actually want the people to have a king. Are you there? God had already agreed with them. So, God has to play along with them. Are you seeing it? Now, in verse 17, And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom... I spoke to thee. Behold, the man whom I spoke to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Can you see that? Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for you shall hit with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go. And I will tell thee all that is in thy heart. Can you see? A okay. seer is a very powerful person because he can tell you what you came for without you talking. Can, can't you see what someone is saying here? Someone said, Don't worry, <laughs> just go up with me to the high place. We are going to eat together. After eating, then I will tell you why you came. So that means when you go to meet a seer, you don't need to even tell the seer that, well, this is why I came. No. A seer can peep into your heart and bring out your, your contention and bring out the content of your heart. For instance, if you come to a seer and you want to say, and you have come to say, uh, maybe I need a job, blah, 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 this is my problem. Even when the seer has never seen you before, once you enter, he can begin to download everything you want to see from the Spirit of God. That's one of the abilities of a seer. So a seer can see the content of the heart. A seer can see 
the content of the heart. Meanwhile, Saul was just looking for an ass. He did not know that God was using that situation to lead him into greatness. May God bring you into greatness in the name of Jesus. This is the best example of what the Bible is saying in the book of um, Romans. When the Bible says, all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, what happened in the house of Saul was not a very good thing because an house was missing. But that bad situation worked together for good for Saul because that was how he entered into his kingship. All right, let's look at... Um, okay, in verse 19, you discover that it was so clear that Saul did not even know Samuel. So Samuel was not able to discern the content of the heart of Saul because he knew him. No. Because even Saul was asking Samuel, said, please, who is the seer? He was asking the seer for the seer. It was Samuel himself that now said, well, I'm the one you are looking for. But don't worry, follow me to the high place. Let's hit. So after hitting, then I will show you, I will tell you why you came. Verse 20. And as for thy houses. Okay, it was not even a single house. There were many. So Simon said, as for thy houses. That were lost. Three days ago. Set not thy mind on them. For they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel. Is it not on thee and on thy father's house? Can you see that? So Samuel now told so he said, The house, the houses you are looking for, they have been found. Are you getting what I'm saying? That means the journey took you know this the journey took so some days because they left they left the moment the house was lost. Now when they got to Samuel, it was already three days. So that was why Samuel said. That's your house that was lost three days ago. It was the moment the house was lost that they left their house. But they got to where Samuel was after three days. So Samuel now said, that house that was lost three days ago has been found. He now went further to, you know, to, to, to speak a parable. He said, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee? And on thy father's house. Now, what Samuel was saying in the parable here is that all these things happened because God has something to do with your family. God, Samuel was trying to say that <laughs> the reason their house, those houses got lost, was because God wanted to bring you to me so that we, I can anoint you as a king over Israel. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribe of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then thou, wherefore then speakest thou so to me? You know, then Saul was like, what are you trying to say? Am I not a Benjamite? Now, you know, there are 12 tribes of Israel. But if you look at the sons of Israel, Benjamin was the last born. So the least tribe in the tribes of Israel was the Benjamites. They were the least among the tribe. So that was why um, Saul was like, uh, what are you saying? Uh, I'm from the, the least tribe. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. So why are you talking to me like I'm a very special person? So you don't you don't have to talk to me as a special person. Are you there? Now that means though the father of Saul was a very great man, but he was a very great man in a very small place. That is in the tribe of Benjamin. In that small tribe, he was a great man. Are you there? That's one thing to take note of. 
You know, that's why Saul was like, what are you trying to say? Don't refer to me as somebody that is so special. Don't talk to me like a celebrity. I'm from the least tribe in Israel, the tribe of Benjamin for that matter. So why are you addressing me like somebody that will soon become a king? So please just talk to me like, like you know, talk to me like people talk to us. Don't try to hype me here. Can you see that? Verse 22. And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden which were about 30 persons. So that's in, in that high place, about 30 people were invited. So Saul and his servant, were, they, were, they were placed in a separate place. That means even in those days, there were, there were separate dishes for separate people. In those days, you know, there is, the, the, there is this kind of, um, uh, you know, like we have now in our parties, there are there's there's what we call VIP and there's what we call VVIP. There's another one we call uh, just for ordinary people. Do you get it? When when we come into certain events, they, they may have to divide the event into three. There's a place for the common people, general people. There's a place for VIP. There's a place for VVIP. Those are people that are very important people. So this high place is also divided like that. So there is common place where everybody can stay. There's another place where uh, some kind of important people can stay. And there's another place where the most important can stay. So when Samuel brought in Saul and his servant, he brought them to the place where the most important people stayed. He did not bring them to the place where common people stay. Can you see that referential treatment? Now, we need to learn how to be obedient. We need to learn how to take advice. Saul was not aware of all these things. He was not even aware that there's a man anywhere called Samuel. He doesn't even know him physically. That was why he was asking Samuel for Samuel. But what brought him into this level of honor was because he yielded to the advice of his servant. His servant. I know you are a leader, but you must understand that God can use your servant for you. Are you there? You may be the teacher in that school, but God can use one of your students to counsel you. Stop thinking that uh, whoever will give you a counsel must be somebody that is better than you, that is more. That's nonsense. You must be humble enough to receive God's instruction even from the mouth of babes, from the mouth of children. Have you read the account in the book of Acts where it was a little child that came to save, that came to save Paul? The information the child gave to Paul was what led to his, his deliverance. He would have died before his time. So God can use anybody to save us. Just like God is using the servant of Saul to lead him to Prophet Samuel. So don't despise anybody. Don't say, okay, uh, this, who, who, who are you to give me advice? Who are you? No, no, that's wrong. We must be open to take counsels from people. And as we do that, it will become easy for God to lead us. All right. Let's move on. Okay. Verse 23. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, Set it by thee. And the cook took up the, the, the shoulder, and that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee, and hit. And for unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said I have invited the people. So Saul did it with Samuel that day. Can you see that? The, the kind of food that Saul ate was a very special one. He ate a special food with the number one citizen of that country. I hope you know that the number one citizen of the con in, you know, in the country of Israel was Samuel. Because Samuel was like the president of that nation. So that means Saul, who was not a very special person, was eating with a special person. Saul was not the number one person in the land of Israel. As a matter of fact, him and his father, they were from the least tribe of Israel. 
but now he's hitting with the number one person in the entire land of Israel. Your background does not matter. What your life needs is an instruction from the Lord. If you can obey that instruction, you will get to the palace. Ah, in our family, before I even went to school, I know the way my parents suffered. So I will not become president. Oh, when you forget. No. Those things does not matter. Don't judge your life by your experience. Let God lead you. That you are starting small does not mean you will end small. Your family may even be the least. But the same thing that God did to Saul, he can do to you. He can bring you to the peak. Even when you have lived in the pit for so long. All you need is divine leading. May you enjoy divine leading all through the days of your life. In the name of Jesus. So Now remember, Saul was not eating alone. He was eating with his servants. So both Saul and his servant were eating with Samuel, who is the president. Can you see that? So what, what, why do you think the servant is also enjoying the same thing Saul is enjoying? Because he was the one that was able to discern the prophet. And you see, what your eyes can see will determine what your hand will touch. Yes, if your eyes can see it, your life will have it. It was a servant that discerned the prophet. So he enjoyed the fruit of his discernment. God is not a wicked God. He will not use you and dump you. If you can discern where treasures are, of course, the Lord will empower you, you know, to take what belongs to you. All right, let's continue. Uh, verse 25. And when they came down from the high place into the city, Samuel commoned with Saul upon the top of the house. And they rose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant to pass before us. And he passed on. But thou stand still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Now, you know, it got to a point where someone now told Saul, so said, well, um, at this point, there are some things I need to tell you that is personal to you. So please tell your servant to step aside. So he stepped aside and, saw, and Samuel began to speak to Saul. Can you see that? There are some things about your life that is personal to you. Other people are not expected to hear, no matter how close they are to you. Many people do not know this. They just talk anyhow. They say everything. No. There are certain things that are personal to you. That's why when someone wanted to start telling, you know, Saul certain things, that is personal to him. That has to do with his destiny. He said, please, can you ask your, your servant to step aside? Destiny talk is not usually an open talk. No. No. You must get this. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. This is the wisdom of God. Don't sell it. 